I am uh, excited to get into the rest of Ephesians chapter 4 tonight. Let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, uh, God, so much. Thank you for your protection. Thank you, God, that you dispatch angels to protect us, that you guard us so that we will not strike our foot against a stone. Uh, God, that your angels encamp around us. God, that you are a warrior in our defense. Heavenly Father, you are incredible. You are an amazing God. We just worship you and thank you tonight. Uh, Father, I just pray for every uh, Bible teaching class that is taking place on this property tonight. God, from the youngest of children to those who are in this room, God, I pray that your word and the power of your Holy Spirit would speak to every heart that will hear your your truth tonight. I pray, God, for faithfulness and diligence among those who are preaching the Bible, those who are teaching. God, myself, I pray that these would be your words tonight, Father, that you would speak through the power of your word and with your truth to the hearts of the people that are here tonight. Pray for the youth group as Brian teaches them. They learn, God, and they grow. I pray you would call them. That you would set aside those who would be pastors in the future, those who would be missionaries in the future. God, that you would be revealing yourself and your grand plan for their life. God, that they would be in submission to you. Uh, Father, I'm thankful to be here. Thankful for all of those in this room. I pray that your word would speak to them tonight. Thankful for all the children downstairs. God, the work that you have called us to partner with around the world. I lift up uh, our dear friend Sean as he is in the Czech Republic working among college students for the next week. God, protect him and give him words of truth from your Bible, from your word, God, uh, that he would come to see a Czech young man know Jesus Christ as Savior. Father, I pray that we would be bold in our faith, that we would share you wherever we go, that we would proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and proclaim how near the kingdom of God is to us. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4, last week we made our way through uh, verse 16, looking at uh, different offices within the church. God has given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, looking at uh, the responsibility that workers in the church have, looking at what they are supposed to teach and what the results of their work and their teaching are. Uh, Just again, reminded in Ephesians chapter 4, early in the chapter, uh, to walk in a way worthy of of what we have been called, to walk in a worthy manner of the way that we have been called, that our life would reflect the calling of God upon us. Uh, We're going to start in verse 17 tonight. We're going to see uh, uh, more of the same. Paul has a recurring theme throughout his uh, letter to the Ephesians. If you've been here with us the entire time, you've been seeing it. He talks a lot about the mystery of the good news of Jesus Christ, how it had been hidden but now is made known. He reminds them constantly of what they were, not losing sight of what they were, that you were dead, that you were lost, but you have been made new. You are now something different because of the truth of Jesus Christ, the power of the gospel. You are something new. These are recurring themes that happen. Unity is a recurring theme among the body, that there is only one God, that there is one Lord. We saw these verses last week. You were called to one spirit, one Lord, one God. We have one God who serves and works in three parts, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We looked at that idea and the thought of the Trinity. Uh, Right in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, 5, and 6, we looked at those. Uh, As we come into verse 17, Paul is going to again be reminding them. And sometimes we might look at Scripture and be like, oh my gosh, we've already, we've gone over this. We've read this. Like how many times? Daily. I think daily we need to be reminded of where we were and what God has called us from and what he is calling us to Uh, Paul does not relent on reminding them and calling them to something new. The thread of Scripture is so prevalent. No matter where you go, we are redeemed from sin. We are redeemed to leave sin. Uh, And that's where he's going to start out tonight. So let's uh, let's take a look. We're going to just go a few verses at a time and and talk about some things. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. So this I say, and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart, and they have become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. He started this chapter out by saying, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Then he says here, I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer as you were. Uh, This is uh, something for me, if if there is a a soapbox or a stump uh, or something to, to 
thump and trumpet in the church, for me, it is that we've got to leave sin. We, we can no longer excuse sin in our lives. Let's not even look around at people around us. We cannot excuse sin in our lives. And over and over throughout Ephesians, we are called to be something different. We are called to change. Paul here is like, I say and affirm with the Lord that you no longer walk. Not one more step like the world. Whatever way you were walking, whatever life was, if your foot is in the air to take another step in that, bring it back and don't walk that way anymore. You must change. You must be something different. And he, he points out what that life is again, the, the, the reminder of what that life is. Don't walk anymore in that life. What is it? That life is darkened in understanding. You're like, I think I understand so much. I, I understand. I don't need God. I don't need the truth of the Bible because I have this understanding of my own. No, you become darkened in your understanding to think that you understand it all. The Gentiles uh, reference to those who are not Jewish, but also in the New Testament, a reference to those who are pagan, who do not believe in God, who do not follow the truth of God. Pagan people, lost people, are darkened in their understanding. When we start to grab a hold of this truth in the Scripture, we will begin to deal with the sin that is so rampant around us in a different way. Like right now, we look around and we get upset about who's going into what bathrooms and what coffee cups say, and we're, we're just upset about the wrong things. We're upset about all of this sin because we're not understanding. They are darkened in their understanding. We are focused on the wrong thing. And here he's like, they're, they're darkened. Understand, they are darkened in their understanding. They are excluded from the life of God. You, the believer, are included in life with God. They, the pagan, are excluded from life with God. Why are they excluded? Because of ignorance that is in them. We talked several weeks ago, uh, back in Ephesians chapter 1, about uh, uh, predestination. You can go back and listen to the archive. I'm not going to go back into all of it tonight. We talked about that a few weeks ago. They have not opened their life to the truth of the Holy Spirit of God. When they are confronted with the truth, they are ignorant to it. They, they, they walk away from it. They are ignorant because of the ignorance that is in them. They are in the world and they do not know better. Again, the point made a couple weeks ago that we cannot hold the world to the standards of Christ and the church. There, there is a difference there. We are included in life with God. We are held to the righteous standard of Jesus. They are excluded from life with God and are not held to the standard of Christ in the church. Ignorance that is in them. And what else? Hardness of heart. I heard a pastor recently was listening to a, just an outstanding teaching lately from a pastor that I respect, uh, another ministry in a different state. And he was talking about the hardness of heart. And he was explaining a very difficult thought in the Bible about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which I'm not going to go into, which is it's the thing to talk about in the Bible. There's a thing to understand about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. He was talking about why people come to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And the illustration that he used was so perfect for me. I was listening. He's talking about we harden our heart by every step we take away from God, removing a plank of the bridge that gaps us and God. We, we, we step away and we remove the way to go there again. And so farther and farther we get from God without a way back to because we are hardening our hearts to the truth of God. You, you keep hearing, maybe you know people like this, maybe you are this. I certainly have been at points in my life hardened to the truth we, we, we try to justify sin, and that's a hardness of the heart. I'm not willing to look and say, this is sin, I must change. I'm trying to justify because my heart is hardened to the truth. Hardness of heart, turning away from, I, I, don't, I, I hear the truth, but I don't accept that truth. I'm going to go the other way of it. I, I want to go around it. I like everything that I hear, everything that is taught, but I don't want that truth. It's uncomfortable to me. It calls me to something different. I don't want to make that change. I don't want to lose these relationships. I don't want to be something different. So we harden our heart to the truth. This is where the Gentiles, pagans, the lost in the world, this is where they live. Darkened in their understanding. Excluded from life of God because of ignorance and hardness of heart. What else? They have become callous. Like I remember, and I think about just simple illustrations. I think about when I was a child, what used to be on television. This is just a simple illustration. This is not in depth. This is not deep. But I think about what used to be on television when I was a child. Like, maybe there would be, like, 
a death scene and you would never see anything. Like it'd be, you'd hear a gunshot and a guy falling over. Now I watch it and I'm like, that's fake. Like they're, they're showing so much more. And we, we're talking, we're like, how can people be so violent? How can people be so rude? How can people be so mean? How can people not understand? How can they not know? Because they are callous. They have become callous in their sin and the life that they are living. That is why we must no longer walk that way. That is why we are called to walk in a different way. It says they have become callous. It says that they have given themselves over to sensuality. Sensuality and sexuality, sometimes misunderstood words. I want to clarify them for you tonight. Sexuality, the root word is sex. So we know where that's heading immediately. Sensuality may include sexuality. It is the pursuit and the feeding of your desire. Whatever I desire, whatever pleases me, I'm going to give into that and I'm going to pull it closer to me. Sensuality, I'm chasing my desires, chasing uh, impurities, I'm chasing whatever I want. I constantly am wanting more. And he says, sensuality, uh, where, I'm sorry, he says sensuality. End of 19, uh, giving themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. So we're like, oh, we see the word greediness. Is he talking about money? Like we think greed and money, those two things go hand in hand. For what he is talking about here, the lost, the pagan, he is saying that they give themselves over in sensuality to what they want so that they can practice every kind of impurity. It says with greediness. They are not satisfied in their pleasing themselves. They're not satisfied. They're they're greedy for more. I want to please myself more. I desire more of this impurity. Peter's like, don't take another step like this. If you're here, you've been here multiple weeks, maybe you're still wrestling, maybe you're still struggling. I would say that it's time to be done struggling or it's time to start being done struggling But we can't just constantly continue to struggle with something. Like, when are you going to grab a hold of the victory that Jesus Christ brings to your life, the forgiveness that sets you free from the bondage of sin that you are called to no longer be a slave to? When are you just going to be done with, I just just had to struggle. You don't understand how much I struggle with this area. Then, Then let's talk about further accountability. Let's talk about further time in the word. Let's talk about what your relationships look like. Let's talk about what your time looks like. Where do you go? What do you dwell on? Like if you're still struggling a year after salvation and you're still struggling with the same thing, like what are you doing to not struggle anymore? I fear for people when they are constantly always struggling with things. I'm like, well, what are you setting up to not struggle? There are steps to take to not struggle. It's uncomfortable, and we don't like to do it. We, we, we kind of like sin. It's within us. The Bible says that sinful desires rise from our lust of our flesh within us. We have to stop that. Paul says, not one more word. First Peter, uh, for me in my life, I've never realized how much uh, the letters of Peter to the church and Paul's letters to the Ephesians, and and his other letters as well, I've never realized how much they hold hands. Like, you're like, well, how didn't you know they're in the Bible? How didn't you know that? Well, I mean, like, Exodus and Matthew aren't the same thing. So why would we think that Ephesians and Peter would be the same thing? Like, different letters, different writers, inspired by the Holy Spirit to write different things. But when I read, and I've been studying through Ephesians, all of a sudden I'm looking at 1 Peter, I'm like, wow, for, for the disagreement that Peter and Paul had back in Acts that you can easily read about, they agreed on what life in Christ was supposed to look like. They, they didn't agree eye to eye, face to face on certain things, but they held hands when it came to this is what our life should look like now. So Paul says, don't take another step. Don't walk that way anymore because of these reasons. First Peter chapter 4, verse 1. In chapter 3 of First Peter, I guess let me... Let me give context. In chapter 3 of 1 Peter, Paul is talking about how we are to conduct ourselves in various relationships that we have around us. So if you have a heading in your Bible like I do, it may say godly living. If you're like, I don't know how to conduct myself in certain relationships, certain settings in life. I don't know how to act as a follower of Christ. I would recommend that you read 1 Peter chapter 3 because it's going to give you insight as to what godly living is. Uh, 1 Peter's going to come back in a couple of weeks, too, as we start looking at other things in Ephesians chapter 5 and, and so on. 1 Peter chapter 4. 
Peter says, therefore, in, in view of how we are to live, in view of what God calls us to, therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose. Wait, what's he saying? He's saying expect to suffer in some way, somehow. Maybe the affliction that we see throughout the world among other believers. We've talked about suffering a little bit through this because we've been in First Peter a few times. Uh, I warned you a few weeks ago that I believe that, that one of the problems that exists in America and in churches in our country is that we simply don't expect that we're going to suffer. For whatever reason, we have removed suffering from the idea of following Christ, and I think that has been a lie that's been woven into what we believe, and I think we should stop believing it. I think that we should read the Bible for what it says and that we should expect to suffer in our lives. He says, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same purpose that I will serve Christ and if I suffer in my flesh, I suffer. He goes on, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. I like that. Like, so you're the person that struggles. Let's just say you're the person that struggles or maybe this is helping you to understand the person you know that is the person that struggles. They, they have not suffered to the point of being done with sin. What, what are we talking about? You come away from the world, there's a, there's a hurt that happens. And it's in our flesh. It's not spiritual. It is in our flesh. flesh. We don't want to withdraw from the things that we like, from the things that our sinful nature finds appealing. But the closer we draw to God, the farther we must move ourselves from sin. It says the one who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. What are we really talking about? Christ suffered in the flesh. Read that died for you, arm yourselves with the same purpose because he who has suffered in the flesh, read that, he who has died has ceased from sin because what's the reality? Sin is never going away as long as you have breath in your lungs. We live in a sinful, fallen, broken world where sin and temptation is always going to be present no matter how strong or how weak of a believer in Jesus Christ you are. It is always going to be present. We are always going to struggle against it. We are always going to strive against it. Daily, we need to take whatever sinful desires creep up, whatever selfish ambition creeps up, we need to put it in a box, we need to push it down by the authority of Jesus Christ in our lives and be done with it. We're not gonna cease from sin until we are in heaven joined with God. Cease from sin, then another component, component so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for the lusts of man. So, now we're still talking about life on this earth. You, you crucify, Galatians says, you crucify the sinful desires of this life. They die. I read a book when I was a young man, it was impactful in my life, where he talked about naming on a sheet of paper, naming the things that you struggle with, the, the, the sin that you have, the things that you know, this is not right, this is wrong in the eyes of God, I struggle with these things. He's like, you've got to crucify that from your life. And the only way that we do that, the only way that we truly find victory in our lives is to allow Jesus Christ to nail it to his cross. Let's deal with repentance. Let's deal with real repentance and be done. Let's move forward from sin. It says, no longer living. Paul says in Ephesians, don't walk any longer. Peter says here in verse two, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. There is a change that happens. I am the redeemed of Jesus Christ, and I do not live for my own, my own pursuits, my own desires, my own wishes. I live for the will of God in my life. That is what I pursue. Verse 3, for the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles. What's he saying? Enough's enough. Let's be done. You've had plenty enough time wandering about aimlessly darkened by the world, what are the words he says, Paul says in Ephesians, darkened in understanding, excluded from God, ignorant, heart of heart, callous, given over to sensuality and purity with a constant desire for more. You've had enough. Now it's time to be different. Now it's time to follow God. And look what he says. Having carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties and abominable idolatries. Verse four, he says, in all of this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excess of dissipation, which is to say reckless living, and they speak poorly about you. If you want a gauge for your life, if you, if you just want like a, maybe a, a temperature check of your life in Christ, 
if people aren't talking poorly about you, they're probably not seeing something different in you. Because when you start taking a stand for God in your life, the world, like, I don't know, they freak out. They start to say awful things. Friends no longer want to be around you. They stop accepting your invitations to come to things. They start saying, oh, I'll be careful for that. He's one of those religious freaks. Like, they start saying weird things. They don't even know what they're saying. What's happening? I'm convinced that God in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory is confronting the Christlessness in them. And that's what's uncomfortable. What are they speaking out about? I'm sick. I am dead in my sin. And I don't want to be around you because there's something that is different that exists here. What does Jesus say? If they persecute you, first they persecuted me. <clears throat> enough is enough. No more sin. Let's be done with it. And let's move on. Let's move on to what? Ephesians chapter 4 again. Verse 20, Paul says, But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, let's let that hang for just a second, realizing that the verse is not over, it continues. You did not learn of life in Christ by living the way the world lives. People are like, oh, I'm, I'm just going to find my own way to Christ just over here doing this. I'm going to do my thing over here. Eventually I'll find my way to No, you're not. going to find your way to Christ living as the world lives. You are not. The Spirit of God calls to a person. The Spirit of God enlightens a person to the truth. The Spirit of God says, you can live different. I can redeem you. I can save you by my power and my power alone, not by your own doing what you want to do. Come unto me. You don't learn of life in Christ by living as the world does. You do not learn Christ this way. What's he say? If indeed you have learned, if indeed you have been taught, <clears throat> Colossians chapter 3, Paul in another letter that is very similar. So uh, for a few weeks I've talked about parallel passages and things that relate, different readings that you can go to uh, where you can study out that this is not just one portion of one spot in one place of the Bible, but that the Bible is congruent, that throughout the Bible we see the same thread of God speaking to us. Like it doesn't change. His message does not change. Paul writes to the Ephesians, he says, If indeed you have learned of him, if you have been taught by him, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, in chapter 2, again, context. Why? Because the verse starts and says, therefore. What have we been learning? If there is a therefore, we do what? It was weak, church, but we back up. That's what we do. Like, wow, this is week 7, everybody. I thought we'd be like, when I see therefore, I back up. We see, therefore, at the start of a verse, we back up. It's all right. By, by the end of week 32, we'll have it figured out. <clears throat> in chapter 2, Paul is writing to the church in Colossa, and he is saying to them, you have died with Christ. You are built up in Christ. Christ took everything that was a burden to you. He took everything that was hindering you, and he nailed it. Some of the most beautiful verses in Ephesians chapter 2, having made a spectacle of those things, nailing them to the cross, and triumphing over them. I love that. Like, I don't know what you came in here burdened with tonight, but if you're still burdened by it, then you haven't let Jesus Christ, the King of all kings, nail it to his cross and have triumph over it as he has. <clears throat> That's what he's writing him in chapter 2, which is a completely different message for another day, I'm sure. Chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, if you've been regenerated by the truth of Jesus Christ, if you have found salvation in no other name, for there is no other name given under heaven by which man must be saved, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Look what he says. Let's be done with sin, right? It's all over the place. We can't get away from it. Therefore, what do we just read? If you've been saved, therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead. We read all these things. As dead to sin. You can use whatever adjective for sin you want to use. Paul uses these. Dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, greed, which amounts to idolatry. Just be, be dead. Consider your body dead to sin if you have been truly saved. Verse 6. For it is because of these things, verse 5, 
that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. If you've been raised up, if your salvation is real, then get your mind off the world and get your mind on Jesus. Like, the real reason, if you're the person that's struggling here tonight, the real reason you struggle is because you are refusing to put your mind in the right place. I'm sorry, but it's that simple. Like, we could close the book, close in prayer, and go home. If you're struggling, you're refusing to put your mind fully in the right place. You're just, you're just like, I, I, I like the things of God. I, I hear the word of truth. But I'm not fully focused on the things. What does Hebrews say? Fix your eyes. There's nothing else to look at. There's, there's nothing else. It's like when you're, when you're driving. I don't know. There's probably not many driver's training students in the room. So let's just all try and remember when we took driver's training. And your driver's instructor, uh, well, I don't know. When I took it, this is what they taught us to do. I don't know how effective or whatever it is, but I try it when I'm on my lawn and sometimes it works. <clears throat> You sit behind the wheel and you drive. And what do they tell you? Look out at the horizon and drive to it. Just, just look out there. Be aware of what's going around you. Look out there and you'll stay in your lane. You'll stay straight. You won't waver. A lot of principles that the world teaches us about following Christ and they don't even know they're doing it. So what's that to say? Well, then let's just say, for instance, that this aisle is a lane. And let's say that somewhere way out there beyond what we can see is Jesus and I do nothing but look at Jesus. It doesn't matter what's in my way. If I keep walking with my eyes fixed, I'm not gonna be wavering and going outside of the line and drifting back and forth, and here comes a car. Like you're, That's not gonna be happening because your eyes are fixed. You go in a straight line. Listen, men who mow your lawns, women if you do, the next time if you have a riding lawnmower, you're mowing your lawn, I, I dare you. Okay, just hear me out. As soon as you start driving forward, I want you to look ahead and pick one spot. Just one spot across your yard. Pick one spot. Don't take your eyes off of it. Make sure your kids aren't in the yard. Make sure the pathway is cleared. You don't want to mow over cats, chickens, baseball bats, rocks, or any other stuff that I always mow over. Pick a spot and just drive to it on your riding lawnmower. And see, when you get to the end, turn around and look behind you and see if that is not the straightest line you've ever mowed. You'd be like, Pastor John is the man. I'm going to have the best looking lawn in the neighborhood. I, it, try me. Just try me. And then think about what you do with Jesus. And think about how you always struggle. And how you always, fl- you're like, man, I just don't want, I don't want to flake anymore. I don't want to flounder. I don't want to struggle. And think about how when that happens, you're taking your eyes off of Jesus Christ. And all throughout the Bible, keep your eyes on him. Keep focused on him. If your salvation has been real, if you have been raised up with Christ, get your mind off the world. Get your mind on the things of God. Life as you knew it should be changing. Paul writes, you died and your life is hidden in Christ. That life needs to be changing. Live considering your life dead to sin because of the sin of the world, because of the sin that exists The wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, the unsaved. You did not learn Christ this way, if indeed you have heard about him. Uh, If you have been taught, just as truth is in Jesus, verse 22, chapter 4, that in reference to your former manner of life, you, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed, I love that word renewed, that you be renewed, made new, refreshed, revitalized, regenerated, that you be renewed in the spirit of what? Your mind. And put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. I love it. Like, I, I don't, it doesn't get simpler. We, we convolute, we complicate I don't know what God wants. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to live a life. You're not reading the Bible because it's so clear. If your salvation was real in verse 21, you didn't learn it by living among the pagans, verse 20. If your salvation is real, verse 21, if you learned about him, then in verse 22, in reference to your former way of life, lay it aside. Just, just, uh, lay it aside. Paul would write in other places, Colossians chapter 3 or 4, he says, put off the old clothes. Take the old clothes off and put on the new clothes of righteousness in God. Lay aside the old self. Why? Because it's being corrupted to the ultimate sentence of hell. People are like, why do I need to put off the old self? Because if you don't, you weren't saved and you're going to hell. 
Sorry. Real salvation, real regeneration of the Spirit of God in your life produces something new. I am done with sin. Any struggle that I have, I am crushing by the power of Jesus' name, and I am a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come, and I am looking toward him. If that hasn't happened, you didn't get saved. I don't know what you did, and you're headed to hell. Ouch. Put on the new self. Why? Because the new self found in Jesus Christ Faith in Jesus, grace of God, the new self is being sanctified to the ultimate glory of God in heaven. <clears throat> Sinful life does not lead to Christ. The teachings of Jesus confront sin and shows us that we must get rid of our sinful ways. I wrote down this equation. Maybe you're note takers in the room. I don't know how many people, maybe notebooks, whatever, margins of your Bible, offering envelopes in front of you to make notes on, whatever you want to do. This is a really simple equation. Ready? Forever is writing it down. I'll wait. I'm looking. I'm going to do like in class. I'll wait, you look at me when you're ready. Put off the old self. You writing? Put off the old self. Plus, be made new in your mind. Plus, put on the new self equals life in Christ. You put off the old you be made new in your mind. You put on the new that comes from Jesus, the way you learn the truth of him, the Bible, the word of God. You put on the new. That is how you live a life for Christ. It's that simple. Be like, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't understand anything. You don't have to. What were you doing? Stop. What do you need to do now? Let's sit down and open the Bible. Right? We say, what do we say? We preach, we baptize, we disciple. You're like, oh yeah, I disciple. I bring people to church every week. Not discipleship. That's not discipleship. Let's get our heads right about what discipleship is. That's you taking what you know of the word of God and sitting down with your arm around someone saying, look what the Bible says. Look what the Bible calls us to. Let's walk this together. Let's live this out. Let's be what the Bible says. I'm glad you bring friends to church. I'm glad you reach out to your neighbors, your family, all those people. You bring them, hear the word of God. Just, just come and hear the word of God and worship with me, please, one time. Come for this holiday thing, this special time. Come. I'm glad that you do that. But real discipleship doesn't happen sitting in these pews. We come here to get encouraged. We come here to be lifted up. We come here to learn more about what we are to be and then we take it out and we put it into practice. Discipleship is you with your Bible and a person who's coming along in Jesus Christ that needs help, that needs guidance. Real discipleship. <clears throat> put off the old self. Plus be made new in your mind. Plus put on the new self equals life in Christ. <sighs> we haven't even got to the tough stuff. Verse 25, <clears throat> therefore, because from verse 17 to verse 24, we are told, put off the old, put on the new. If our salvation is real, we are living to be renewed by Christ in our mind, in our heart, in our lives. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one body. <clears throat> Don't lie. What's going to happen over the next several verses, verse 25 uh, and on through maybe verse 29 or so, uh, if you're into the parallel references, if you want to search some things out, Paul is going to write to the Ephesian church almost, almost a New Testament Ten Commandments, if you will, which aren't new, which are based on the truth that God gave us for living in life. He's going to lay out things that are almost Ten Commandment in nature. Parallel passage for this is Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 through 17, which is the Ten Commandments of God. God delivered them to the people of Israel at Mount Sinai. And you're like, well, that's the Old Testament. I want you to see the relevance in both old and new. We don't look up the Bible with preference to various passages and say, well, I, you know, that was just, that was the history, like, that's just poetic. What does it mean? It means that God preserved his word in this fashion for us to read because it's important and we need to know it. It all exists for a reason. There is relevance. Just because we don't understand something, like the Old Testament is difficult sometimes to understand. There are things that we look at and we're like, what? And we don't understand it. Don't allow not understanding something to devalue what is written in the Bible. That's a dangerous thing. You start looking at you're like, I don't understand this. It must not be important. Like, it, no, sure, to your human mind, but where's your seeking wisdom from God? Where's your searching out what the scripture says? Where's your flipping and you end up holding like your fingers are in like six different places and you're like, I wish I had another hand so I could mark more places as I search the truth of the word of God. There's relevance. 
Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25, he says a lot of words to say, don't lie. Stop lying. Lies come from Satan. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 44, he's talking to uh, the Pharisees here. They're not understanding, which they never did. Verse 44, John chapter 8, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. We must put off falsehood. We must not lie. And people in the church, this means we don't lie about the condition of our life. How you doing today? I'm great, praise God. Like, the Bible says to carry one another's burdens, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. I can't carry your burden if you just say, I'm doing great. Woo, praise God. Did you hear that song? you see those people? Man, it was great. Praise God. I'm doing great. Let's be honest with one another. We're scared to do that because the world has told us let's not be vulnerable with what's going on in our life. Like, then all of a sudden you start hiding things. Like, nobody understands what you have hidden in the cabinet that you pull out to sip every night. No one understands why you always are going to the pharmacy. No one understands why you have to run out at all hours of the night to go find an addiction to please you. No one understands why you're going after these things. Because you're not telling the truth. You're lying. Don't lie. He writes here to the Ephesians, lay aside falsehood. He says, lay aside the old self. He says, if falsehood is where you wrestle, take falsehood off and boom, set it aside. Be done. There's falsehood, and I'm done with it. Walk away from it. We're speaking the truth. We should speak the truth. Ephesians 5, or 4, we read it last week. Verse 15, speak the truth in love. That's going to come back in a couple more verses. We speak the truth. Philippians 4, 8 says, whatever things are true, think on these things. Be done with lying. Be done with falsehood. <clears throat> Man, some of this stuff is heavy, church. I'm not going to lie. I read it. I study it. My wife, we've been sitting in my living room the past few mornings. I've been doing some study early in the morning, and I read it, and I'm like, man, the Bible, though. Some of this stuff, church, I hope you know, I might come across sounding harsh. I might sound upset. I hope you know I love you. Please know that I love you. I wouldn't say these things and go to these places if the word of God did not convict my heart that we are called to something more. We are called to a godly, Christ-like standard. When we teach these hard passages and we work through these things that are difficult is because we love you and we don't want you to stand before God and have him say, I didn't know you. I don't want that. That terrifies me. Verse 26. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. Some verses here that are sometimes pulled out of context. You probably just read it, you're like, oh, I know that verse, don't give the devil a foothold. People are like, just don't give the devil a foothold. They say, just don't give the devil an opportunity. They just pull that out. Don't do and that's a great principle. If you know what the foothold of the devil is in your life, stop giving it to him. Look what it says, don't give him an opportunity. Don't give him a foothold. But if we don't pay attention to the whole passage here, 26 and 27, one verse, be angry and yet do not sin, calls back to a passage from Psalm. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. Three things we're told to do there. Four, actually. Be angry. But let's be careful with what we allow to produce anger within us. Sometimes we get angry about things that we should just walk away from. Sometimes we allow things to produce anger in us that is not healthy, that is not profitable, that is not beneficial. We just give in to our anger. The Bible says be angry. God got angry. I can get angry too. Well, okay, let's look at what God got angry about. There is a righteous anger. There is an unrighteous anger. There are clear examples of righteous anger in the Bible. Men moved by God in anger against unrighteousness, against godlessness, do you hear what I said? Men moved by God, not themselves. It is not man exacting his judgment on what makes him angry. It is not man exacting judgment on what he thinks makes God angry. 
Righteous anger in the Bible, the righteous anger of God, is God moving men to exact his judgment on unrighteousness. Always. Not to prove a point, not to win an argument, not to make your in-laws feel worthless. None of those things. None of them. God uses men to move against unrighteousness in his anger. What are clear examples? Well, there's this time that Jesus went into the temple in Jerusalem. We read it sometimes just so uh, plainly. He fashioned a whip and drove him out of the temple, and the temple should be called a holy place. Jesus was filled with a righteous anger. You are mocking the things of God. What's he really saying? You are mocking me. You have not accepted or believed who I am and you are mocking me. It is written, my house will be a house of prayer and you have mocked it. You have made a mockery of it. It says he was flipping over tables and kicking down desks and fashioned a cord to drive them out of the temple. Righteous anger. There's God and the Israelites. We don't have time to talk about every example that exists there, but the Israelites produced anger in God because they were ungodly in their actions toward him. They did not follow, they did not obey, they did not heed his word, and he would have to execute judgment against them. Righteous anger is God moving men to execute his judgment, not ours, against unrighteousness. There are clear examples of unrighteous anger in the Bible as well. Men moved by themselves against other people. One example that came to mind this morning was King Saul and David. King Saul hated David, and he was angry about him. David wasn't really what he was angry about when you read the story. He was angry because he sinned before God and lost everything. David and Saul, an example of unrighteous anger, his pursuit, his handling of him, everything was unrighteous, and David only ever acting righteously in return to King David. Then there's the same David who acts righteously to the king with this guy named Shimei. You read about it in 1 Kings when David is near death. He remembers that Shimei cursed him and he tells Solomon, you go kill that man. Acting out in his anger, executing his judgment on a man. Clear examples of righteous and unrighteous anger. Men moved by themselves against other people, unrighteous. Men moved by God against godlessness, righteous. We need to be careful about what makes us angry. James chapter 1. Like, you can get angry my wife and I was working this out in my head. I was like, what do you think about this? I don't even know if we should be getting angry, to be honest with you. Like, it's not something that I struggle with, really. I get angry about some things, I guess, sometimes, but like, I don't feel like it's a major struggle in my life. Maybe it is, and I'm blind. God, open my eyes if I am. I think we should be careful about what makes us angry. James chapter 1, verse 19. This you know, my beloved brethren. He's talking about where sin comes from in the preceding verses. He's talking about every good and perfect gift coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no shadow or shifting. Verse 19, this you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God as a way of the world. To be angry is a way of the world. God is like, he, he says in his word, be quick to listen. Be slow to speak. Be slow to become angry. Not be slow to listen and be quick to speak and quick to become angry. That's what we do. Our humanity is completely counter what God would have us be. Put it off. Put off anger. He asks Jonah, do you have good reason to even be angry? Jonah's all upset about the Ninevites. He's all upset about this thing that God grew, this branch that God grew and gave him shade and gave him wind and then it died. He's all upset about it. You're not even going to destroy Nineveh, God. And God asks Jonah, do you even have a good reason to be angry? Do you have good reason? Let's be very careful about anger in our life. It says, be angry and do not sin. If you can have an anger within you that does not cause you to sin, then you should be very careful with that anger. What are you going to do with it? What's produced it, and what do you need to do about it? What does he go on to say? Be angry and do not sin. If you have anger, don't let the sun go down on it. You settle it quickly. So people are like, is that like literal? Like the sun's going down. I got a person I am angry with. Go deal with it. Get up from your pew, walk out of this teaching, and go deal with the anger and stop wasting time. Stop letting it erode at your soul. Stop letting it hinder a relationship and deal with it. Be angry. Do not sin. If you are angry, don't let the sin go down on your don't let the sun go down in your anger. And what? Don't give the devil an opportunity. This is why I don't think we should be getting angry. Because my anger is an opportunity. 
Because Satan is a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He came to steal, to kill, and destroy. And if I get angry about something, I am giving opportunity for him to do that. I'm just like, hey, come on in. Come on in. Give me opportunity to, to be angry and sin in my anger and let the sun go down and let it fester. We've got to be very careful with anger. Don't give the devil an opportunity. Let's be done with anger. Don't lie. Be angry and don't sin if you can. Don't let the sun go down on it if you don't want to let it live. Don't give the devil a foothold. Verse 28. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Stop stealing. Every in the room is like, I don't do that. I don't, like, I was 14, okay? It was a candy bar. I don't steal. Maybe you don't. Maybe you don't walk into stores and try and lift stuff. I hope you're honest about taxes. I hope you're honest about money earned. I hope you're honest with your employer about time spent. I hope you're honest with people. People go to work and they, they, man, I used to go to work and I would waste a lot of time at work doing what I wanted to do, not what the job required, stealing time, getting paid for it. It's stealing. Don't do it. Stop stealing. Look what he says here, though. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good so they have something to share. There are those who would draw from financial resources because they don't work yet are fully capable. Stop stealing. There are assistance programs that I am aware of. They are called assistance programs, not subsistence programs. Sometimes we get into a bind. Sometimes we get in trouble. Sometimes we hit a rough spot. We're like, I need some help. And there are programs that help. Some people are fully capable of working. Some people are fully equipped to do a job. Some people have resources at their hands to go and work, and they don't, and you are stealing. Stop stealing. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul is sharing an example of this very thing, saying, when I was among you, I worked. I did not take from you without working. We labored all day. We labored all night so that we were not just taking from you. He's explaining all this, and then he comes to verse 10, chapter 3, 2 Thessalonians. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. This is where we get it. How many times you heard it in your life? You didn't even know where it came from. You don't work, you don't eat. How many times? You, you heard it all over the place, probably since you became of working age. If you don't work, you don't eat. Well, there it is. This is where that came from. There's a biblical principle that the world teaches, and they don't even understand Christ when they do it. Verse 11. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Busy doing all these things. I'm carrying out all this stuff. I just, I don't work. And I need some, I need this. I need this handout. I need this assistance. And you're, you're looking for assistance to become subsistence, and you got to stop stealing. The Bible says, stop stealing. Why don't you work? Oh, man, you know, I just, I mean, I can't find a job. Sure you can. You're not willing to do the job that you found. There are jobs everywhere. Today I was at the Argentine gas station, and they have a sign on the door that says, now hiring. I just, I can't find a job. You go into that place? Because they're looking for people. I, I just, I, I can't find work. No, you're not willing to do the work that you found. Well, I mean, you know, I just, I can't live on $8 an hour. Then get two jobs that pay $8 an hour. You work. Stop stealing. I looked at this and I'm like, Lord, I don't want to stand up in front of the church and say that those people who are drawing on things and able to, I don't want to tell them that, but look what he's saying. Those who are stealing must steal no longer, but they must do something with their hands. Later, the same guy writes, you're not even, you're, you're trying to eat and you're not even doing anything. Our good friends, the Thompsons down in Haiti, I learned this from them. Uh, Mike uses this among the Haitians. For those of you who know the Thompsons, Mike Thompson, the, the Haitian people, like, they think that we're just super wealthy up here because that's what we've projected ourselves to be. So you're down there working. I had this little kid. He's like nine years old. I'm sitting in the shade. I'm like, man, I'm really tired, and I'd love to go home oh, and take a real shower and be with my family, but here we are. 
right? Because sometimes you struggle. This little boy comes up and sits next to me. I'm like, hey, you're a cool little kid. He, can't, he doesn't know a word I'm saying. He's looking at me and he's like, give me a dollar. And I was like, no. Give me $100. I don't have a dollar to give you, let alone $100. Give me something to eat. I, I, give myself something to eat. They just walk up to you, give me a dollar. Give me your shirt. Give me this. Give me that. They have nothing, understand. They have nothing. People are like, oh, I, I have nothing. No, they have nothing. Nothing. The kid probably didn't even have a home to go to. Give me something. Give me something. The Haitians come, they're like, give me something. Mike, Mike, give me something to eat. He's like, what'd you do today? I did nothing. Then you don't eat. You want to come and work with me? You want to work with me for like an hour? You want to sweep the floors or something? I'll give you something to eat. You earn it. There's a discipline that we are to have in our lives that stop stealing. Sometimes we're not willing to look at these things and be like, wow, this is hard. It's not just lifting a candy bar from a store anymore, is it? Verse 29. <clears throat> Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. That word unwholesome, originally, the original word that Paul wrote, what he meant was let no rotten word. Rot. I think of my kids leaving filthy banana peels on the counter and I don't see it till the next day. Rotten. Don't do that. Rotten apples. I was cleaning our van on a couple weeks ago. My daughter dropped an apple core under the seat. It was growing all sorts of fuzz. It looked more like a rat than an apple, and it stunk. She just left it there. Rotten. Don't let a rotten apple come out of your mouth. You look at that, and you're like, oh, that's disgusting. What would you just say, though? What are you saying to people? No unwholesome. Let no unwholesome, let no rotten word proceed from your mouth. But only such a word as is good for edification, to edify people. To edify are the words that you're using, building people up. Only such a word is as good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear it. Not unwholesome words. What is unwholesome? Unwholesome, I looked it up. Not characterized by or conducive to health or moral well-being. If you start judging your words on that scale, we're probably all going to end up being a lot quieter people. Don't say words that hurt people. I, I, just, I think simple things. I think about that simple Disney movie with the deer. I'm like, what kind of buck did that thing grow up to be? If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. That little rabbit, Thumper, and his mom, and all that stuff. Like, we don't even look at it. We look at it. The, the world's teaching us things that God says we need to do. We just, uh I'm going to speak bad about my boss, and I speak bad about my wife, speak bad about my kids, speak bad about my family. I'm just going to speak bad about everything. Not unwholesome words, but words that are good for edifying, good for edification, the instruction or improvement of a person morally or intellectually. If we started speaking like that, we would have to learn new vocabulary. If you only speak a word that helps someone grow in their morals, and grow in their intellect, we'd probably be like, hi. Think about what God is calling us to, church, that which is good for edification, good for building up the body. Speak these words. Ephesians 4, 15, again, earlier in this chapter, speak the truth in love so that we will grow up in all aspects into Christ. Put off falsehood and speak edifyingly to people. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit. What's that mean? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Holy Spirit of God, it says, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Literally, stop doing things that are contrary to what God wants you to do. I'm just, I'm just living a Christian life. I'm out here striving, plugging away, but I got this sin. You're grieving the Holy Spirit of God, and you might not even know him. Don't do things that are contrary to. Don't give the reason for the Spirit of God to look on you, the sanctifying Holy Spirit of God, right? The Holy Spirit's job is to come into your life and put his finger on that thing that's got to go away. And it irritates you, it agitates you, and all of a sudden you come to the altar and you're like, I've got to deal with this thing. God is burdening me, and you deal with it. To grieve the Holy Spirit is to deal with it and then go back to it, like your sin. You, I've, got to, I've got to deal with the sin. I need a savior. I need to be saved from this. I need the power of Jesus Christ in my life. And then you return, the Bible says, to the same flood of dissipation. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Do not do what is contrary. Grieving the Holy Spirit. The human mind, enlightened by the word of truth, 
It's prompted when you try and do what is wrong. There's that moment where you realize, I'm about to do something that God doesn't like. And you stop right there. Wherever you are, whoever you're with, whatever that means. This is contrary. I'm about to grieve the Holy Spirit. I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. There's a lot of things wrapped up in there. Look what he says. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger. This goes back to be angry and sin. I can be angry as long as I don't sin. Now put it away. It's not good for you. It's opening a foothold for the devil. Get rid of bitterness. Maybe you've got an ex in your life and you're just like, I'm so bitter, I just don't understand. Put it away. Put away bitterness or it will devour you. Put away bitterness. Put away wrath. I will exact my vengeance on that. You know, you don't get to do that. You do not get to take away the room that God needs to exact his vengeance. You don't practice your own vengeance on people. Put away anger and clamor and slander. Stop speaking badly about people. Put it away from you along with all malice. Paul's just like, you know what? All these words, malice. Put it away. We live kindly towards each other. Verse 32, be kind to one another. Tenderhearted, that is to say compassionate and forgiving each other just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Why are you telling me I have to forgive that person? Jesus said, if you do not forgive men when they sin against you, I will not forgive you when you stand before my Father. We forgive people. We live a life of forgiveness. We live a life of kindness. We live a life of compassion. I'm just, I'm not sure how God wants me to live. Like as a, I I don't know. Let's start with kindness, compassion, and forgiveness this week. There's three things. You're like, I don't know what to do. I just gave you three things from the word of God that you can work on in your life over the next week to live a life after the word of God. Church, the next couple of weeks, we're gonna be in Ephesians chapter five. There is probably not any one more chapter of the Bible that I could be more excited about opening with you. It is a chapter in my life that has been absolutely, mm, it's a foundation. If I'm so excited to open Ephesians chapter five with you, we'll do that next week, but let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. God, I thank you for your word. Father, I thank you for the truth that it exposes even when it's uncomfortable. God, I thank you that you would use me God, I'm a a sinner, that you would use me to use your word for these people, God, that you would confront me in my own life. Thank you, Father, for your word of truth that speaks to me. I pray, God, that your word has spoken to someone else in this room the way it has to me over and over so many times, God. I'm so thankful for your word, so thankful that you give direction as to how to live a Christ-like life, how to follow you, how to know you, how to lead others to you. You don't just let us figure it out on our own. There's no question mark or I don't understand. You fill it all in, God. Thank you. I pray, God, that we would be stirred to move into your word more, to read it, to be diligent over it, to apply it, to use it in conversation, God, that it would be powerful in the lives of people around us. God, we love you. We thank you for your grace and your goodness, your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great night, church.